This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Um, but just to be aware of when you are using 
social media platforms, obviously we're sharing um, information very freely and thinking about sort of what the copyright limits might be. And then finally, I really don't think this is going to be a massive concern to academics, but it's important to be aware of sort of emerging and developing, developing criminal laws and as they relate to communication and information sharing. Um, and certainly if you've been following media law and news in terms of how it's been affecting journalists, it's been um, really brought to the fore in the um, prosecutions of journalists <coughs> for voice mail interception under the Regulatory and Security Powers Act. Um, and, some, um, and, and developing law around racial hatred and computer related crime, for example. So, obviously, those would apply to anyone that's using social media uh, and, and blogging platforms. Um, thinking in terms of the academic context, I would suggest that sort of defamation, copyright, privacy, contempt are probably the biggest external issues to be on top of. In terms of thinking how we operate internally in a university environment, I've been doing a little bit of research when I came here to find out sort of what training is available, for example, in relation to data protection and data security. So I'm not going to talk about these at any length, but I just sort of put on the on that side the sort of things that might crop up in thinking specifically about how you're engaging with the university and sharing information about, about working here, for example. And also to be aware that you know, uh, your work can be subject to freedom of information requests, for example. And underpinning all of that is, is ethics. I really needed a sort of ethics stamp to, to go across that, but um, as I put this together, that was beyond my capability. Um, and I think often law and ethics are talked about in quite a separate way, but I think really they should be complementary where possible. They sort of do go hand in hand. And generally, if you take quite a sort of straightforwardly ethical approach to the way that you communicate and you share information, that more often than not will protect you in terms of sort of legal structures as well. Not always, and sometimes there's a friction, so doing the ethically right thing might actually put you in confrontation with, with the law, for example, protecting a source, and that might put you in contempt of court. But generally speaking, if you look at sort of the way that defamation law is structured, for example, um, some of the defences there do go very closely hand in hand with a, a straightforwardly ethical approach. But I know you've covered ethics in the previous social scholars in there, I think, so I'll stick to the law. So I thought I would share three examples from non-academic context, but I think where the examples of where there have been unexpected legal consequences from some form of online communication. Um, and two of the, the first two are quite famous, so forgive me if you're very familiar with them. Sorry, with the facts of these examples already. So this was a criminal prosecution under the Communications Act um, relating to a menacing communication. This became known as the Twitter joke trial. And this was a tweeter, Paul Chambers, um, sent this jokey tweet to his girlfriend, frustrated that um, his local airport in Nottingham was closed. And he said, he tweeted jokingly, you've got a week and a bit to get your shit together, otherwise we're blowing the airport sky high. I mean, even just presented out of context there, you know, many of us might see that that sort of was, was a jokey tweet, but that's not how it was originally viewed. Uh, and he was successfully prosecuted for this menacing communication. He appealed successfully eventually, uh, but obviously it was a long process. And if you read his sort of reflections of being in Boylan, I think he does regret sort of tweeting that. And he says, well, maybe it, it, it seems misguided when you look at it now, but he just had, you just had not imagined what the consequences might be that someone might perceive that as a serious um, security issue at the airport, for example. Um, and there's lots written about that, I got lots of celebrity attention because various comedians came out in, in support of him. So that's my first example of you know, unexpected legal consequences. Um, secondly, the Simon Singh case, which um, became very prominent as a, as a libel claim, um, I think because it was one of the sort of central claim, claims that prompted the uh, was at the heart of the, the, uh, the campaign for libel reform, which led to the creation of the Defamation Act of 2013, which is now in force. Um, Simon Singh, a very well-known science writer, wrote an article in The Guardian, um, and this is a, the, 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 the particularly contentious paragraph that I've quoted at the top of the slide, slide there, where he talked about the British Chiropractic Association and what it was claiming it could do through, its, uh, through, through the treatments. Um, and he said, this organisation is a respectable face of the chiropractic profession and it happily promotes bogus treatments. And it was that word bogus that was particularly problematic as to what he was accusing them of. 
Um, the BCA were very unhappy with this. Um, it's something it's written since all of this, it's, it's something it's said, said, said publicly since this, all, all of this is over. They said, you know, here's a published article that had explicitly named a chiropractic association and made defamatory comments about it. Um, they pursued silencing personally um, rather than the Guardian. The, the Guardian temporarily took the article down while, while this was in, um, under dispute. Um, Simon Singh fought it all the way, and he spoke very publicly about the fact that he had the resource and the, you know, the money from his successful science books to be able to do this. Um, and in the end, it never went to full trial, in the end there was a ruling um, on meaning that went in his favour, and at that point the BCA um, dropped their, um, decided to discontinue the claim, and I presume you know, costs would be set in Singh's favour whether he's been able to recover them all, I'm not sure. Um, but the, the, the key issue here was whether what he was claiming was a fact and he would have to show the truth of the fact or whether he could um, defend this as a, a, at the time was fair comment is now known as honest opinion in the Defamation Act 2013. But again, you see how something that was written fairly probably, you know, sort of a piece of uh, media content um, provoked um, and, and, and clearly would have a relevance to sort of um, academic research as well, um, provoked sort of unexpected libel action and led to um, a lot of time, stress, and, and money being spent. My third example is a very recent one. This was just in the news um, this week. This is about the prosecution of uh, a newspaper editor um, for breaching uh, what's known as a Section 39 order um, in a story where there was a, a around a court case where a school worker had been accused of sexual offences. They didn't name the child involved, but they did name the school. And then been a specific 30, section 39 letter <coughs> which didn't allow that, um, and so the, 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 the editor was convicted um, of, of this offence and, and he appealed that. But crucially, he was unaware of the order being in place, but that gave him you know, no protection whatsoever, and that's what's been upheld in, in this latest appeal, which is just um, released on the 23rd of April. Um, so I know it's a media example, but I think it's quite useful to thinking about even if you don't know about a reporting restriction, that's not necessarily going to give you any protection. I've picked out three examples in academic context to share as well, um, some of which relate to, to specifically blogging and social media. Um, my first one um, was a former lecturer who wrote a series of, of blog posts um, about individuals at his, at his former university. It's quite surreal, the blog for you. If you, if you. I don't know if the post is still up, but when I, I remember when I looked at it at the time. Um, it led to you know, a, a, you know, a big row, lots of money spent. In the end, the university discontinued um, the action eventually and got you know, a, a quite a lot of negative press co coverage around this. But I thought that was really interesting, looking at how the university interacted with a blogging lecturer. Um, um, potentially, the sort of the fallout from that case may sort of give universities cause for alarm, perhaps before, before rushing to that sort of response. Um, and what was established in the, in the, in the final judgment, um, which led them to, to discontinue the case um, and in Duke's application to have it struck out, was that really this was about the individuals, and it would be the individuals that should be pursuing Duke um, in, in this claim rather than the university. My second example is, is another one that's been it had lots and lots of media attention. This was Dr. Peter Wilmshurst, um, uh, an academic who was sued by a NMT Medical over comments he had made in a, a lecture that he gave in the US about the safety of the device that they were using to treat heart conditions. Um, and this went on for, for years. I mean, it's incredibly stressful for him. And he was another figure that was very prominent in the, in the libel reform campaign. Um, arguing for better protection of speech. Um, and he, he described one quote in The Guardian how he's given this lecture in America, picked up by a medical journalist in, in the US, put online, and then he was sued in, in England and Wales. Um, and it really didn't, it wasn't clear during this, this litigation how it was going to go, and eventually the company went out of business and, and you know, the claims slipped away. Um, but there you see sort of Again, what you might think is a quite a safe environment in terms of an academic conference, but where something led to <coughs> some serious legal ramifications. And then finally, this was a lesser reported case. Um, 
this was um, a forthcoming conference paper and the academics were planning to upload the conference paper and make it public um, for the conference. It was a security conference. Um, they had um, discovered details of how to crack a, a VW immobilization system. Uh, VW sought an injunction on grounds of confidence and also the likely damage that would be caused to cars if people knew how to, <laughs> to, to uh, basically it would lead to theft. Um, and one of the researchers involved in the study was from the University of Birmingham. Um, but in this, in this example, um, the academics didn't win the, 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 the injunction, the interim injunction, injunction was granted uh, to VW. Um, and, and as you see there, the quote, but then the, you know, the University of Birmingham gave a public statement saying it was disappointed but respected the judgment. Um, but the, the judge in, in, in that case made very clear that not only was this on grounds of confidence, it was also it was clearly the, the millions of cars that were going to be affected was a very crucial factor um, in terms of the potentially facilitating these thefts. I thought that was a really interesting case. I think it had reports in the BBC and the Guardian, but it didn't necessarily get the, the kind of mass coverage that the, the other cases I've mentioned did. And of course, it can work the other way. It's not always academics that are the defendants in these cases. I've picked up two examples that I'm aware of where academics have pursued legal action in, in civil litigation. So one was a University of Sussex PhD student, Luke Cooper, and this was in the, one of the, the last libel trials, uh, sorry, not the last libel trials, the last jury trials for libel, because since the, the, the new act is very unlikely that we'll, we'll, we'll have any or many more jury trials. Um, and he successfully sued the Evening Standard and the Daily Mail for the, the way that they could portray, portray his involvement um, in the student protest, which led to the Milbank protest. Um, in, I'm trying to remember now whether it was in 2012 itself or whether it was the year before, but around that time, um, and that he, he said he'd been misquoted and misrepresented, um, and he was yeah, successfully secured um, damages against those titles. Um, and then the second case, another one that didn't really receive very much media coverage, but I think is fascinating, which is Sarah Thornton, who is a sociologist specialised in the art world. She's written a book called Seven Days in the Art World. I, don't know else. I was trying to find my copy at home, but I don't know what I've done um, and Lynn Barber, who is, has a reputation as being a rather ferocious uh, interviewer of celebrities, wrote a, a sort of damning review of it. But the specific issues that Sarah Thornton had with that review were not that she just sort of said that the book was bad or something. It was that she, Lynn, it's quite complicated, but Lynn Barber was listed as one of the interviewees in the book. And then Lynn Barber sort of implied that she hadn't actually been interviewed, which obviously was dam very damaging to Thornton's credibility as an academic. Um, and also there was a discussion around whether Sarah Thornton had given copy approval to the people that participated in the book. So Sarah Thornton sued the Telegraph Media Group uh, for libel and malicious falsehood um, and was successful in that case. Um, and it's interesting in, 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 a, in a various number of ways in terms of what it established in, in libel law. I won't go into too much detail on that. But, but really interesting if anyone wants to read the judgment and also what it reveals around journalistic process um, and Lynn Barber's process. It's really it's a fascinating story. <coughs> so those are sort of some very brief snapshot examples of you know, the ways that communication interacts with law um, in, in various different um, contexts. Um, I've done quite a bit of research sort of talking to journalists, bloggers, not specifically academic bloggers. Um, about their experiences and also interviews with media lawyers and media law specialists um, and, and sort of analysing case law and policy documents. Um, and these are sort of some of the main uh, sort of quite broad conclusions that I have. That even when people have more resources and, and legal knowledge and training, so even when they have sort of a lawyer at hand, it didn't always actually have an enabling effect. It can obviously <coughs> enable people to, to know how close to the line they can go and you know, what, what the legal limits are and the parameters and what, what's likely to attract litigation. But sometimes people sort of seem to self-restrict on the basis of what they did know, so the, sort of the more they knew, that actually had a more inhibitory effect. So there's sort of this paradoxical effect going on there. But clearly it is beneficial to have proper legal advice in place and in media organisations where they have proper systems with lawyers to, to check um, material that's very helpful. Um, when I sort of I, originally, I was trying to look at a number of different case studies and really understand you know, how the law had affected people being deterred from publishing material or how it had um, encouraged people to change the way they handled material. 
And every example I looked at, but it was always so much, so much more of a complicated picture than just saying the law has caused this, because actually everything is embedded in a sort of very rich social context. I mean, that sounds quite obvious, but so for example, I was looking at a group of bloggers who run very small local news websites, and in the surveys that I did with them, a lot of them mentioned their sort of relationships with neighbours, and that wasn't necessarily a legal decision, but just sort of worrying about how people in the local community perceive them. And when I was putting this together, I thought there might be a connection with academic work as well, that we might not only think about the legal context, but also how we're perceived in our field and our relationships with other academics, or what criticisms we might make about our employers, for example. Um, and as I already mentioned, I was looking at the law around def defamation, specifically libel, um, and that even though people were sort of saying, oh, privacy is the new libel, um, or more recently, data protection is the new libel, libel still seemed to have the, the bigger impact at that point in terms of causing people to change or abandon stories that was, um, and people seem much more aware of the issues there, and privacy sort of seems quite uncharted territory. And sometimes lawyers would say to me, oh yes, we're dealing so much more with privacy now, and then when I sort of press them about the number of complaints they're getting, they'd say, oh, well actually no, libel is still sort of more problematic one. Um, but that brings me to my last point, which is that very little is sort of systematically known about what goes on. So the sort of the stuff that happens in court is, um, the, the tip of the iceberg, and so we know a little bit about that. Um, I've, I've moaned at length about the lack of good documentation in the course, even, but at least we know something that's on the public record there. But in terms of what happens under the water, if there was an out of court settlement, something might be a threat but never lodged as a formal claim in court, that all happens sort of invisibly. So unless you have the people that are involved in the case, either the defendants or the claimants, wanting to go public about it, we might not know. Um, so, and I suspect you know, there's very little that's sort of known about academic interactions with law other than these sort of higher profile examples that make the media, but I, you know, I suspect there's lots more going on under the water. But clearly there's a lot of uh, uncertainty, um, some of that is down to the sort of lack of resource issue, um, and that can have a, what's known as a, a chilling effect. Um, in fact, could be understood in lots of different ways, but this is where sort of legitimate publication might be wrongly deterred. You know, you are, you are legitimately allowed to share and communicate that information, um, but you might be deterred from doing so because of a, a maybe a miscomprehension about the law, or because you haven't got sort of proper legal advice on hand, or if you were <coughs> in Simon Singh's position, but you weren't Simon Singh with his financial resource and his sort of, you know, um, I guess he was pretty brave to sort of decide to take on this case, and you, you know, you might decide not to defend the case or, you know, to, to just sort of settle it quietly. On the other hand, of course, people are probably, you know, it's likely that people are publishing stuff that really isn't legitimate under the law and is illegitimate and that you sort of get away with it because just because you put something that's illegal online doesn't necessarily mean that anyone's going to pursue civil action against you or it doesn't mean that it will then necessarily will be a criminal sanction where relevant. Um, so, you know, you might get away with careless mistakes and something else that became clear in the surveys was that in a way there's and with the interviews as well that if you're sort of small, you have some, um, there's almost a sort of protection, I guess, in that, you know, the, the reputational damage that you do to someone is so, so much more reduced. It's not an absolute protection, of course, but that's potentially why a lot of mitigation is still centred around these sort of big, powerful publishers. Uh, I'm not endorsing that as an approach, by the way, but I'm sort of observing it. <laughs> um, and, and certainly I think as individuals and small publishers, we need to act and remember that everything we do it is a publication if it's to a third party. And the other area of legal uncertainty, just to mention, I mentioned the Wilmshurst case where he said something in the US and a claim was brought here. You know, the vice versa could happen. I was speaking to media organisations that were getting sued in other jurisdictions and not just within the UK. So we're operating in global environments. So that's very uncertain. I mean, it kind of makes the mind boggle when you think potentially all the ramifications of what you do, what could happen. And practically speaking, it's quite unlikely. But you should be aware that, you know, that, that exists in the in jurisdictions with much more draconian laws than, than, than in the UK. So I've got a sort of, just uh, sort of two final concluding slides, just my, my wish list for things that, that could be developed. I think when it's sort of small people uh, and individual publishers especially, uh, that, you know, there needs to be better protection. You know, this is really, really complex law, which need much faster systems to resolve disputes. So I just, sometimes I think that the, court, the whole court system is so clunky uh, it can lead to very, very high legal costs. So I think there needs to be much more work done in reducing legal costs, making sure that there's alternative dispute resolution.
paths for smaller defendants to, 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 to be able to use. Um, this was discussed in the context of the Leveson inquiry, although it was very much focused around big media organisations. And that's all then got caught up in the whole politics around media, media regulation, which I think is a shame because it sort of buried the debate about the, what I think of as the small people. Um, another useful thing that I think would be useful for, for, for small people would be a sort of a pro bono support network. Um, some lawyers have just looked to be horrified when I've suggested this. Uh, others would be quite glad to take part in, in, in it. There was something that was operating at Harvard in the US, um, well, so that's a, sort of a model that I quite like. It was called the Online Media Legal Network, but where you might have lawyers sort of offering their, you know, their, their time on a voluntary basis um, to social media users and bloggers who sign up to some kind of code of conduct and prioritise public interest activity, I think. Um, I mean, I'm, quite often because of what I'm writing about, I get approached by a friend of a friend who says, oh, I've got into this mess, what shall I do? And I can sort of, you know, you can sort of direct them to websites or you can say, you know, oh, this is friendly lawyer. You know, they might be able to tell you, but it's very informal, and I always think, well, there should be a more sort of a, uh, you know, sort of a helpline or some kind of organisation that you could approach would be really useful. Um, there is an organisation called the MLDI Media Legal Defence Initiative, but they generally deal with sort of uh, bloggers in sort of areas of conflict, and not tend, doesn't tend to be sort of UK-based bloggers that they're helping. And then finally, I think there's a space for better education about communication and information law, um, potentially at a school level as well as universities. Um, you know, it's, given the, sort of the myriad of, of laws that we need to grapple with, I don't think there's any harm in sort of in, in unintimidating ways to trying to communicate that to people at an early stage so that we have a, a better familiarity, especially with contempt of court. You know, this is no longer the age where you only have a newspaper court reporter who's able to communicate what's going on. You know, it's much easier for a much wider public to engage with that now. So in terms of what we can do, I don't know how many people are internal here, but um, in terms of what we can do at SAS, um, these are a couple of the things that I've been looking at since I started in my role. Um, it struck me that it might be quite useful to have a sort of a general law and ethics training day for external and internal research scholars and focusing on the social sciences and humanities because of the interests that are here. Um, so I'm looking to set something like that up at the IELTS for the next academic year and I'd be very grateful to hear any thoughts that you've got about areas of particular legal concern or experiences that you would um, appreciate, have appreciated help on. Um, we're talking about developing some in-house training on, on data records management and data protection for SAS staff, that's something I'm going to be having a chat to, with, uh, to Matt about later. Um, so that should be happening, so I think, I assume that we'll be eligible for all SAS staff to be able to sign up to that. Um, but a more sort of, I know today it's sort of been a, a mix of sort of practical and it's not, it hasn't been quite such an academic research discussion, but um, I have been discussing with a couple of colleagues at SAS um, about the growing, uh, in, in relation to data protection, it's sort of growing um, what's known as the notion of the right to be forgotten and how that affects sort of handling of archive material, for example. So we're thinking about having some kind of lunchtime roundtable on that particular issue and you know that might then lead on to other discussions on other, other areas of law as well. And then finally at the centre I, mean, I think I would like to do some more empirical research looking at the relationship between communication information law and academic practice so I'm kind of starting to draft a proposal in that area but I haven't got that far with it yet. Uh, so that's it I've put some resources there for internal people those are the SAS policies um, and then the, also University of London some guidance on records management and then also obligations under FOI and data protection, which are quite useful. Um, well, that's the sort of the working guide to media law. It would probably satisfy a lot of lawyers, but for journalists it's a really handy resource and I think it translates very well to academic practice as well, <coughs> since there isn't a sort of specific academic guide to media law. Um, so I reckon that that's the edition before last, but there's an updated edition of that now. I find that that's not meaty enough, and this is quite a good textbook. Um, by one of the sort of leading law professors, Eric Berendt. Um, and then for very quick guides, the BBC College of Journalism has a really you know, very simple, um, if, you was, if anyone was sitting here thinking what exactly is defamation, that would be the place to go to go and get very sort of simple definitions and explanations. And outlaw.com, out-law.com does some really good sort of news bulletins on issues and so <coughs>